Um, good morning. Um, we are ready. So, first, first thing, presenting ourselves. Uh, my name is Nuno. Uh, I'm a designer, UX designer, call it whatever. Um, I've been doing. Uh, I work for KDAB. I've been doing design for ten years. Um, most of I started doing design. I started doing. Uh, I started with uh, icon design, which uh, is a very specific type of design, and then I move on into doing uh, more traditional or more broad uh, types of design. Uh, and in and most of my work, I started uh, was uh, in KDE, where I started. KDE is a deeply connected with Qt uh, project. So I've uh, learned through the years how to deal with, uh, with developers and the pains that developers have uh, and the pains that designers have uh, with the communication. And it's not always easy. Uh, and I think that's the experience I bring to this training. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicola. So contrary to Nuno, I'm a developer. Uh, I'm here to share my point of view, my side of the process of designing an application. I'm working at KDAB uh, for four years now, and I'm using Qt for 10 years. And recently, I've worked on Qt Quick projects. Um, I'm, I'm from France, so if there are French people in the class, I'd be happy to uh, talk about the rugby final and why we should have won. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, that, that's it. Uh, we will try to share our point of view during this presentation, the designer point of view and the developer point of view of the process of designing um, an application. So that, uh, that brings me to a very good question. Uh, how many of you guys are, would call yourselves pew designers? Sorry, you call us what? Pew designers. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. <laughs> okay. You know this training is uh, the name might might lead uh, lead lead let you guys a little bit off track. Uh, the the name is designing user interfaces with Qt Quick, but the purpose of the training uh, is mostly to teach uh, Qt Quick to designers. So, and developers, raise your hands. Awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, cute developers. <laughs> okay. okay. And uh, cute quick developers. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So maybe Any some of the parts of the training will be too easy for you. Yeah, but there's still a camera, and I hope uh, on the other side of that camera there will be <laughs> designers. So um, the the objective um, when when I was uh, preparing myself to, for this training uh, and this training takes like three days uh, to do um, the full training and when I was and there's there was no way I could do the the full training during today and we had to rethink the training in terms of uh, what you guys and hopefully what designers in this room would expect from this training. Um, so we please open the, the computers. Oh, most of you already did. Uh, check out the handout. You have the materials there, the examples. Yes. Please follow the examples as we show them. Don't, um, don't hesitate to play with the examples uh, with us. And uh, also don't hesitate to ask any question you have during the presentation at any time. We'd be happy to answer it, if we can. Um, and so uh, when I was preparing, um, I first thought, OK, I'm just going to do the, course, the first four modules, module one, two, three, and four. But then this presentation would be, this training would be very much like the training going on in the other room. So we, try, we redefined a little bit this training. and. The thing we are going to do, and this is just so you guys have an idea of what this training will be about, uh, is that 
Um, first, we are going to show Model 6, uh, which is interesting. And maybe, hopefully, by the end of the training, you will understand why we started on Module 6 and finished on Model 6. Then we go to Model 1, Model 2. It's the basics of QuickPick. Most of you guys already know that. Know it, um, but hopefully others don't. Um, then module three, module four, real fast, module five, uh, and module eight, and we'll probably finish on module six if we have time. So, starting on this module, um, so I was thinking that uh, if you guys were designers, this would be completely different. Uh, well, so I'll try to explain you a little bit how the design workflow usually works and give you a little bit of an idea of the pains that designers have. Um, oh, maybe I have a question. How many of you are working with a designer? Okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. It, it, I'll try to explain you the pains that we suffer and maybe give you a little bit hint of who we are and how we deal with you guys. Um, so this module here is mostly about uh, how designers interact with Qt Quick and how awesome it is. Um, but first, the first thing uh, that this module does is uh, specify the, the design workflow and um, give you an overview a bit of how we work. Uh, so in for Nokia, they think that, and I think they do think correctly, that five of my main areas are key to create um, uh, successful consumer-based products. Those, and those are technology, business appearance, interaction, and functionality. Three of those areas are uh, mostly UX, or the stuff that uh, designers deal with. And and uh, see, uh, they are a fundamental part of the, the product. Um, right. So this is the traditional model. First, we have uh, interaction designers that will find out the whys, identify the user targets. Um, uh, then we'll move on into the real work, the part that um, the, the first two areas are real work. But I'm more, I intervene more in the, the third area there, so I tend to think that the third is more important, uh, which tells you something that I will tell you right next, um, which is the U production, creating sketches, wireframings, wireframes, the graphics, uh, the mockups, uh, and the prototyping. And then we, in the final, we evaluate uh, the user interface. So. This is the workflow, again, it's mostly the same slide. But something that sometimes developers have a, a hard time understanding, and even designers have a hard, hard time understanding, is that not all designers are the same. There are interaction designers. There are graphical designers and motion designers. Um, I'm mostly in the middle, but I've been doing a lot of the first and the last uh, item, mostly, uh, and now with Qt Quick, I've been doing a lot of the uh, motion design thing. And it's not easy, even among designers, to talk between each other, uh, ourselves. The languages change. The language of an interaction designer, I was hoping to have a friend of mine here, uh, we, which is an interaction designer, and we have some problems. Uh, communicating between ourselves. Because he, he uses, uh, in the final stage of his work, he'll start creating wireframes and sketches and send them to me. And he uses a web tool, and I don't like the web tool at all. So it's complicated for, for the communication part. And the same goes to, for graphical designers when sending uh, work for motion designers. Because motion designers will try to create a flash uh, out of your mockups. And there's always something that will go wrong. And, and if I may, if there's something missing on the slide, developers, which, which you are. Uh, 
so we we uh, we arrive at the end of the chain, and uh, we gather all the things from the designer, and we try to understand what the hell they want us to do with the application. So as you can see, there's there's difficulty to communicate between people, the different people here. Motion designer, graphic designer, developers, etc. And why, in your opinion? Sorry? Different, different, tools. different tools, yes. I would say different languages, right? And even the, the, product, the, the, the things that we send you, Okay. Sorry? It was an answer to your question. Yeah. Sorry. We have a mic because they can't. Uh, okay, it was an answer to your question on why uh, we can't, why, why it's difficult for designers and developers to work together. And I know for my own sake, uh, if I'm not very thoroughly described what I'm going to implement, I'm more or less. Uh, unconsciously going to implement what I think is fun and not necessarily what is needed by the application. So, it's, it, well, that's how I am. It's difficult not to do what's fun if you're not told what to do, then you just do yeah. what you like or to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If, if you have a the designer coming and saying that you, he wants a transition between this screen and this screen and you ask him, how? Well, just make f things fly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not really precise. So you need a way uh, to understand what the designer is. And, and another element is that I would guess that most of the times when you get the documentation, even the documentation is kind of weird. You'll get a huge PDF file with a description of the hows and whys of the application doing something, and that's one language. Then you'll get a couple of mockups from me and it, pretty pictures, yeah. and then some flash files. Yeah. Right? You had this experience? Yeah. Um, and most of the times I would guess that the documentation doesn't exactly matches the, the, everything they want to say. Yeah, exactly. So th even the problem that you have, we even, we even have it on with designers between our, um, uh, ourselves. So, and then they go on explaining how you do things. And this is not very interesting for you guys, not even for the for the designers. So here comes Cute Quick. And this is the fundamental part. Maybe if we talk all the same language, maybe we can communicate a lot better. What if uh, the interaction designer can use Cute Quick to create wireframes and pass those wireframes to me, the graphical designer, and I can replace the wireframings with, and that thing I understand. I don't need to check uh, the web application where, the, where my colleague made the, the wireframe is and try to transpose the, those elements into a mockup, a final mockup. Um, no, I simply get a file where those elements are all visible. I won't miss a couple of elements because I didn't click on the button on their web thingy that I don't really like. Uh, all of the things that are supposed to be there, are there. I cannot miss it. It's in the code and it's in the elements of the uh, cute quick thing. And we'll explain a little, a little bit better the, uh, this, all of this works uh, along in this training. Um, but I won't miss that. And probably I'll uh, replace all of the elements with proper mock-up images, pass that to the motion designer, and write a few hints, so oh, why don't we do this animation like that or like this, and it'll implement those animations and create their, his own animations, and probably before sending the, this to you, will send it to me and ask me to review it, and I'll, oh, it's great, but I would change the position of this element or that element into here or there, and I can do it myself. I don't need the, the um, I don't need to explain it over uh, three emails how I want it to change. I can change it myself and send it back. So we're all speaking the same language now. And we can send it to the interaction designer and he can see what we've done and see if he agrees, or if it's online or what he wanted to do and everybody's talking the same language. And then we pass it to you and how do you like the process? 
Yeah, because that's something we can use. We, we, we see exactly what the designer wants to do. And um, the most important thing is that we are using the same language for all the people on the chain. So we can, we can do a two-way communication between the designer, the developers, or the different designers. That's what QtQuick is about, changing the design process for your application. So and then they go on and explain uh, things that it's easy. And it's actually easy. We'll show this uh, during the, the training. Um, and they have an example here about how it works. And I like this final image they have, where it shows the old team. And I think um, this will. Uh, this is kind of my conclusion of on Cute Quick. Uh, and I'll share it a little bit. Uh, and I hope by the end you'll agree with me is more, more important than the technology. It involves, it, it's the, the social aspect that is fundamental here. It's very easy, and I don't know if you've been into a project where you're assigned a specific job. Do this. Do, well, I've been there many times. Do a couple of mock-ups for this application. Make it great. So I receive some uh, work, some wireframes, from my colleagues, I'll do my work, pass it along, and I'm done. Then, um, if anything goes wrong, it's not really my, my problem. I did my, I did my work on, uh, perfectly, it was fine. And if it doesn't work, I'll blame the interaction, desi the, the the interaction des yeah. designer or the developer, like That's usual, true. that doesn't understand what I'm trying to say. And because, yeah, I've done my work, and it's not my app. It's some work I've been assigned to. I've done it. It's not my thing. So I think this graphic is good because it shows um, the flow, as, as you're saying. Yeah, and it's a, it's a two-way flow. So when we are at the developer stage, we can go back up and go down again. That's important. OK. And this is model six. And hopefully, we'll. Yeah, okay. Show a little bit better this on at the end of our training and see how we can do this type of work with the tools that we've learned during today. So let's start at model one. Oops, sorry. Uh, by the way, all the PDFs are on the website of Qt. Uh, I don't remember the, the link, but we, we can give you if you if you are interested. But they, you have this on the handout, right? Yeah. Okay. They have the. So, I don't think. Do you have model zero there in the handout? We are not doing model zero. <laughs> We are skipping <laughs> directly into module one. So, um, it looks like most of you know already Qt and uh, maybe Qt Quick. So, I'm not going to talk about Qt. Uh, what is Qt Quick? Qt Quick is a set of technologies. Uh, and under this name, you have three different things. You have QML. QML is a new language. It's a declarative language uh, compared to imperative language uh, used to describe your interface. A declarative language is a language where you write what you want to see on the screen. Contrary to an imperative language, language where you write how you want things to be done. We, we will go back on the difference between declarative and imperative a bit later. Um, it's an interpreted language, so you don't, you don't have to compile it. And then you have Qt declarative. Qt declarative is the library and module in the Qt library uh, used to uh, parse your QML file and run them. 
it's also used to create a bridge between the C++ code and your, uh, your interface code. And finally, you have Qt Creator integration. Qt Creator integration comes with different things. So you have a syntax highlighter for QML file, uh, completion. You have also a debugger for QML file. And uh, you have some nice thing to uh, package the whole thing for some phones. So we, we talked okay. this morning about uh, the, the last Nokia phone, for example. In Qt Creator, you have some target to package your application for the phone directly. And when you, we start learning a new language, the first thing you do is to create a Hello World program. Who am I to break the room? So here it is, the Hello World program. Um, there's one line missing. We will talk a, a bit uh, about it, but most of it is here. So basically, sorry. You create a rectangle here with 200, or 200 width height, and inside you put a text with Hello world. Really easy, as you can see. Uh, Qt Quick is available since Qt 4.7. So it's the minimum version you should use. Uh, Qt Creator, we will use Qt Creator during this presentation, so I won't show it right now. And finally, a uh, comparison between two different languages. One is ActionScript on the top, and the other one is Qt Quick. Uh, who knows ActionScript? <laughs> I don't know it. I have no <laughs> idea where it's used, actually. Is it some kind of flash or no? A web thing. Web thing, OK, web thing. <laughs> um, so both code do mostly the same thing. Which one do you prefer? Okay. <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> so Qt Quick uh, is really nice because it's, it's short and you understand really quickly what you are doing and what the code is doing. Uh, basically, the code is a, a button where, where uh, printed clicked when you press it. Okay. And I let you know, continue. No. Okay, so um, not the type of product I was expecting. So you guys pretty much know all of this. But anyway, uh, layout and interaction. Um, this is where you start and where, where do we start? We start with what we put on screen. And what is the most simple thing you can draw in a, in a screen? Question. Pixel. What is a pixel? It's a squarey thing, right? It's a square. It's a rectangle. So the most simple thing you can do uh, in a screen is a rectangle. Rectangles have a few things properties that make sense in a rectangle. They have um, size, they have a border, uh, something inside, a color, so things like that, position. But can we have something a little bit more simple than a rectangle? The space a rectangle defines. And in Qt Quick, they call this an item. An item is, roughly speaking, a rectangle without the visual properties of a rectangle. It has no uh, color, no uh, border, but it defines a space. And this is um, the most simple element uh, Qt Quick does, an item. And it has some properties, like anchors, Clipping width, height, and the width and height are pretty obvious. Opacity, uh, kind of not 
so obvious, but it will become obvious uh, when you understand the concept, when we talk a little bit further on the concept that items are nested and belong uh, and can be inside one another. Um, rotation or scale. And yeah, and that's the most simple element in, in Qt Quick. And so, to, to give you a, a comparison, if you know Qt already and Q widgets, an item is basically the same thing as Q widget. So, item is for Qt Quick, what Q widget is for Qt, normal Qt. Okay, and how do how do you? Uh, this is uh, already a little bit of code and. Uh, looking at how things are stated in QML, we'll see that we have something here that we call an, an item. It, it's an element. All of this, all of these things, an element. Um, and just looking at it, we see that as a, a width of 100, an height of 100. This is in pixels. Uh, it has an X, which is the starting position, and something that we call an ID. And it, the ID thing is important in QML because binding uh, properties is something that we do a lot in, in QML. Um, and to bind something, we need to call it by its name. So the ID is the name of the element that, uh, that we are using. And it's very important that we, uh, if you plan on, it's not mandatory, elements do not need to have an ID, but it's good practice to have uh, IDs for them so you can use them and have them with meaningful names. Because if the code gets big enough, it's easy to get lost in names like X as 33. Um, and another item here, and you see that we named it differently. Obviously, you shouldn't name your uh, elements with the same name. It's confusing for you and for the application. It doesn't work. <laughs> it, it doesn't really work. Doesn't and then you see a little bit of concept of uh, binding, where something that we'll mo talk a little bit better in, in the future um, is binded to the ID of the first item. Okay. Rectangle. So a rectangle um, is, well, a rectangle. And better than trying to show you uh, a rectangle, I'll just show you the code. It's much better. Which one was it? Item example. Right, rectangle on item example. So let's just press play. I think you see it here, design rectangle. And so you, you can see he's a designer. He likes wobbly <laughs> windows and things like this. Of course, I've designed it myself in this case. <laughs> Oops. OK, so you see that it's an item. We start with an item with a width of 100 and a height of 100. And then nested inside it, uh, we placed a rectangle. Uh, anchors fill, I need to explain what anchors fill is. Um, it basically says that the, the size of this rectangle equals the size of the parent uh, element. And we could replace parent by label, by label one, and it will work just the same. So you can always call the parent element by parent, or you can even do parent, parent, parent. So yeah, you can do stuff like that. And uh, it finds a color, red, a border color, black, a border width, five pixels. And I can show you something that is interesting to show here in the case of binding, is that because we binded the, the, the property for for the size here. As soon as I scale the window, it, the item gets scaled as well. And everything works, see? Okay. So um, from the developer's point of view, there's two interesting things here. 
Uh, the first thing is the first line, import Qt quick 1.0. Uh, when I, can you go back to the, yep. uh, when I talk about the Hello World example, I, I said that there's one line missing. That's the one missing in the slide. You need to import Qt quick to use it. The second thing is that in, the, in a QML file, you have a hierarchy of items. And it's constructed using uh, nested items. So you can see the rectangle here is created inside the item. So the rectangle is a child of the item. And there's only one root uh, item in the QML file. And this root item is particular because it defines the width and height of your application. So when we start the application here, it will have a width and height of 100. Okay. Okay. So. And well, now we created a very basic rectangle. And for designers, uh, the most important uh, item you can you put on a, a canvas is images, stuff that you generate on other places and put here. And now does, does it work? Oh, it's very simple. Um, very the same way we did with uh, um, the rectangle. We declare now image, we name it, uh, and we declare the source. And basically, that's it. Um, it's good practice not to put the size of it. Qt will do it for you. Uh, we'll get and put the image in a one-to-one -one ratio, so something that uh, is important to designers, uh, that it's pixel perfect, and it will be pixel perfect. Though, sometimes we want different things from, from that. And I'll show you how to do a little bit different. So, the item. Image, image example. Image example. Where is it? Ah, here it is. So let's see an example here. As you see, we have an item with an height of 300. Um, and what does it do? It's very simple. It's just a spaceship, nothing much. Um, we parent it to the center, so it gets like this. But what if? You want it to scale to the entire eighth, uh, to the to the size of the of the canvas. Oh well, you can use the design tool. Go here, press layout, and tell it to stretch to the entire size of the thing. And this is applying um, uh, an anchoring system. And as you see, the it's the our friend the anchor still parent, but that was a stretch. What if you want different types of scaling? There's, as you know, several types of scaling. What if, for example, you want fill? Well, I don't know, but I could go into help, and then help is really easy to pull in Qt, uh, in Qt Creator. You just put the mouse on top of the element you want, press F1, and if you press F1 twice, it gets big. So what am I searching for? I don't like reading text. Oh. Something like this, right? Oh, tile, here it is. And it says image with height in there, fill mode, image tile. Must be this, right? Just copy paste, something I love to do. Paste, let's see if it's what we want. And yes. Now the spaceship is tile. There are several types of things that you can do like this. Um, another element that is particularly interesting for designers is, and again, talking a little bit about in, uh, the properties, it, image and rectangle uh, inherit the properties from item. All of the properties that item has uh, image and rectangle share. 
They also bring their own types of properties. For example, in the, in the case of image, we have a property named fill mode and a property that is source. So they bring their own types of properties. Um, and then, and this, this com concept of inerrancy is very uh, fundamental and uh, common in, in QML. A lot of elements are kind of child elements of elements that uh, were uh, defined before. An element that I find extremely interesting for designers is, an, is the border image element. The border image element is kind of like an image. And as you see here, it's similar, but it has a few quirks. And it's awesome for designers because it's allow, it allows us to make scalable elements, scalable UI elements. An image is scalable, but it's not, pre, it's not scalable the way we traditionally want to scale something. For example, a button is divided like this. And I'll show you an F1, and everybody will understand what I'm talking about with border image. I'm talking about this types of elements. That I know that designers, I've spent hours of my life doing something like this. Hours, days, uh, which is creating an element and then slicing the element into nine different PNGs, preparing that under a single zip file, explaining to the developer, well, this is like this, and I want the scaling method to be like that, or we're trying this in CSS and, never, and failing miserably on the, <laughs> on the uh, uh, browsers. And here it just works. It's awesome. I love uh, this this element here, and it allow, allows us to um, create uh, scalable items on the screen. Um, and the thing that I wanted to show you is that it, apart from, it's it's an inherent it's an inherent element from image, but it brings the, its own uh, sets sets of pro properties. So we know image. What is missing? Well, you could say that triangles and other basic shapes are missing, but there is, for a designer, those are just other types of images, and even the rectangle, I really don't need it that much. I can do everything with an SVG or a, a PNG. But text, well, you can do text with rectangles. I would not advise you to do it. It's <laughs> painful. Uh, and there's a lot of things that text does, if you, as you guys know. Um, so a little example of text, and let's go back to our Hello World example. See our Hello World, there it is. And just to show you again, how easy it is to change things. And I'll be doing this a lot in this training, going into the designer mode, which I find it very interesting for designers. Um, and see how easy, and you don't actually need to many times touch the code. You can do many things without it, touching a line of code. So for example, you can change the text here. I like Swiss font. So, not serif, never serif. I can go to my favorite font and stuff like that. And magically, it all app appears here. So, text. Another thing is that, for example, let's see, I'm supposed to talk about text input as well. So, what is it? Input. Okay, let's see the difference. It looks the same. Maybe it is the same. Oh. I can add it now. So that's the difference. Uh, the difference, well, there are more differences, but the main difference between text and text input is the text input you can interact now with, uh, with the elements you've just created. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, now that you have seen text and text input, I, I would like to go back to binding and what the declarative language is really. Um, so le let me take this example. We have a text and we have a rectangle. And what we want is that the rectangle width is the same as the text width. So what we do is that we write exactly that. So in the rectangle, oh, sorry. On this line, what we say is that the width of a rectangle is the width of the text. So here you can see that we use the, the ID of a text element to get it. It's like a pointer. And then we, we, we get the width. But the most important thing is that this binding is not just a static binding when the application starts. It's always true. Which means that if I'm using here a, te a text input, and I'm changing the text here, you can see that the width of the rectangle is following the width of the text. So that's the declarative part of QML. Imagine what you have to do in Qt if you want to do the same thing. What would you have to do? Create a signal, create a slot, connect the two, etc., etc. So with QML, we just say we want that, and it's working. Okay. I suffer with you guys. No, I don't. <laughs> anyway, um, so there's text and text input. Why does? Don't you love computers? Um, so. With text input, we glimpsed on what we're going to talk about now, which is interaction. Um, you have noticed, but text input does a lot of all of these elements, all of the all, many of the things that in in Qt, Quick do do this. It's a lot of magic behind the scenes that uh, we don't really know. But fundamentally, there was something in the text input uh, element that was aware of mouse because you noticed I clicked on it and magically, uh, you can explain better how that works, but uh, magically I started typing and that works, right? So there was something that was mouse related in the text input. But in Qt Quick, um, <coughs> we defined something that we call uh, a mouse area. And many would ask now, why? Because you just saw, saw example text input as something that m was kind of a mouse area because uh, it reacted to mouse. Why, why do you abstract, why do we abstract mouse area from the, the element that it belongs to? Why do we do this? And the reason is mostly, it's a very pragmatical reason has to do a lot with uh, phones and the new types of uh, interaction models, is that clicking something with your mouse is easy. Precision with the mouse is very easy. Uh, you can define an object with four by four pixels. You can still click it with your mouse. A, bit, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of work, but it's not impossible. So an, uh, an image with four by four pixels is already pretty small. So you get, don't try to do a one pixel point as uh, a interaction factor because you can't see it on screen. But four by four, uh, it works and you can click it. Uh, nevertheless, on the phone, if you try to define a four by four pixel thing and try to click it with your finger, it won't work. So you need to def th this idea of uh, abstracting the mouse area from the actual e element that it belongs to is very much in the lines of this, is that sometimes you want to do that mouse area 
way larger than the actual element uh, which it belongs to because it's much easier to click on. Um, and other types of, of things like that. Maybe sometime, maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm a designer and I think that even though I place the button here, I would like the touch area to be everywhere. Or just an example. I'm using this little application I made and it's a it's, a, it's telling us that yeah, we yeah. have still 45, 36 minutes. No, no. They, they can't see it because of the... Oh, yeah. Awesome. And I've defined a mouse area <laughs> that takes the entire space. I press once and it stops. I press again and it starts again. If I would press twice, it would reset. But I, that's all things that we can do with mouse areas. So I've defined a mouse area taking the entire screen. And then I have other mouse areas going in there. There's, several types of interaction that I was able to do with the mouse area that would be a little bit more tricky to do with, uh, with the other system. So, uh, and that's, that's a fundamental change between QML and QWidget. In QWidget, the, there's no mouse area. The mouse events are forwarded to the widget itself. Whereas in QML, you have a mouse area for mouse interaction. OK. Let me show you a few examples. And something that also, in a way, shows a little bit of the problems is let's go well mouse area. Okay, so let me just show you what it is. It is a green rectangle with a red rectangle inside it, and you can scroll it. It's a scroll bar, basically. Um, side note. Um, I've done a few uh, semi-complex applications with QML, and uh, QML is very, well, let's not talk about component stuff. Let's leave that to the end, but if you're trying to do widgets, it's, it's, it fastly becomes uh, a lot of work because cute widgets already have a lot of logic inside them, like a uh, mouse area, but a lot more. For example, a scroll bar, doing a complete scroll bar is a lot of work and you have to do a lot of code to do a complete scroll bar as you expect on the desktop. Though, the, f the fact that you have to write it all makes it flexible enough to adapt to several types of uh, user interface, because not everything is the same. And the, this is something I love about it, the fact that I can change it, and sometimes change the slight, slight behaviors of it. And again, now showing you a little bit of the code. Uh, so as you see, there's a rectangle here the slide that we call it slider. Um, there's a width of 300. It's the green thing you saw. Probably developer will like me better if I do it like this. And the color red. And then we define something that is mouse area. And the uh, you define the mouse area that is anchored to the parent. I don't like it at all that it's defined like this. I think it's much easier to understand. Like this. Oops. These are all properties that do the tracking part. Kind of magic. But you see, you declare some bindings here in relation to the um, sizes of the elements, so everything works. Okay, so after my changes, see if it still works. It still works. And that's a thing. Yeah. But here we, we have just seen how to drag things 
what we would like to do most of the time with a mouse area is to interact with a click or press action. So ca can we just, for example, change the color? Uh, no. The color on press? Okay. On press. Can it be on click? So we just declare on click. We state that the handle color, oops. Equals what? What's your favorite color? Blue. Yes. Ask for pink. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if it works. It works. Now it won't go back because uh, we haven't defined how to do that. But unpressed and released. Okay, unreleased. So you can see here, we are using what we call a handler. So when, whenever you click the mouse area, you do something. And to do this, it's using the on and the name of a, it's a, it's a signal, in fact. So on signal. Okay, stop playing. <laughs> <laughs> But you can play. You can play. Uh, yeah, please computer. play with with the examples. It's much more more fun if you guys play it uh, as well with it. And it has all of these signals, uh, as I was showing them. And sometimes they work. Uh, and on cancel, on click, on double click, and it mimics most of the things that you can do uh, on on the desktop. But even if you try this on the on the on mobile factors. You still can correlate, and this is the really fun part about it. Not everything is the same, but testing is fundamental. And giving this power to designers is awesome, because I can test if, OK, on press is not working. I would like to make this work with uh, uh, a little bit longer. Uh, I need to press uh, on press a little bit more and see if it works. Uh, and I can change the, the behaviors of the press and playing with it. Because the fundamental thing about this is that while you play and you have fun with Qt Quick and you can see it on the phone or a target device straight away, uh, it, it makes it much more fun and it makes you much more of a part of the, of the process and of the, of the project and you start to feel that it's your baby in a way. So that's the type of thing that we like. Um, Other than, well, there's also focus scope and text input, and that's usually the, the uh, keyword uh, interaction. Now, before I talk about this, there's mouse area, there's focus scope, there's flickable, and there's also other ways of interacting with, um, with your uh, devices. Uh, and in Qt Creator, there's an entire area uh, that you can do interaction via, for example, the wiggling the phone and sending signals to to the phone. Uh, if it does that, it does. There's also a lot of ways to, to do interaction. But here we are keeping it simple and doing the things that we already do in the desktop. And key navigation uh, is one of the important ones. We do uh, interaction with the, the, the software with keyboard a lot. Um, and so this is an example of how to um, make an application that is aware to the keys being clicked. I always go around. This one. It's focus. What's his name? Focus scope. So let's see what it does. Oh, this is way too small. Just change the size of the text. Something like this is much more visible. Play. Now you can see 
press A, B, or C. So I'm uh, going. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's really interesting for designer because there's no compilation step, so we can just use use it, execute the thing, and test it right now. Yes, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, press A, B, or C. So I'm going to press E. Nothing happens, of course. Press A and key A was pressed. Let's just look at the code a little bit, see if that makes sense. So there's a text part. We call it my text. Um, and then a new item, call it key handler. Apparently the focus is true. Uh, and then <coughs> some magic here. And apparently if event key, key, key A is pressed, it then the text becomes key A was pressed. So, magic. This is all a bit of, this is a JavaScript snippet. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So, um, one, one thing here, uh, keys, the keyword keys you can see here, it's not like mouse area, it's not an item. It's what we call an attached property. So it's always come with keys dot something. Keys dot unpressed, keys keys dot unreleased, etc. Et you can't use keys curly braces and do something. That's and the, another thing, there's only one item at a time which has the focus, of course. And we'll talk about focus now. The so focus is important. If you remember the old days, the DOS days without a mouse. Well, I find it interesting, very interesting. Um, in when, let me show you one thing. See, in KDE we have a huge discussion about active windows. Um, and for a very good time, it was, it led me to a, several discussions inside KDE because I wanted to do windows um, where the, color of the window decoration is always the same and it melds into the application. And this was problematic because a lot of developers apparently still use the keyboard to change focus and have and need to know the window that has focus. Where for me as a designer, there was never the problem because I interact mostly with my computer with the mouse and whatever as the mouse as the focus. So that was something that was a bit outside of the scope of my problems. Um, and if you remember the old DOS days, uh, you would have to use keys to change the focus on items in order to be able to edit them. It's very similar here. And I'll show you the example of the square. It's key location. So, Let me pull this to the center and zoom in a little bit so you can see. Uh, using my keys, I can do this. Wow. Uh, how do I do this, by the way? Let's see. Well, there's something here, a grid, but we'll talk about grids further on in this training. But very simply putting it, we have four rectangles, and we do a little bit of magic here, which is kind of an if statement, and we ask is, are you, actually we're basically asking, do you have focus, true or not? If true, then your color is red, if not, then it's light gray. And then we do a key navigation for arrow right, and we send the focus to item two, or to item three. Every time one of these items has focus, it's aware it, it can do the key navigation and then it changes the focus to another one. So simple, that's how it works here. Questions? Please stop me if you have questions. I've got a question. Okay. Um, I can see how it wouldn't be a problem with the keyboard input, but how would you cope with multi-touch on something like the sliders? 
focus for it? For, for using multi-touch, do you have to worry about the focus on a slider? If you're going to have two sliders on the screen and maybe two fingers touch one slide, a slider each? Um, it depends. Multi-touch is a kind of magic. Right. Right. Uh, because it, it's still not really multi-touch. It, it's mimicking, and if it, if it picks up, for example, a pinch, it sends a pinch yeah. signal. Right. Uh, not the two points. I'm not exactly sure how that works yeah. so far. For, for multi-touch, it's, it's like mouse area. You have something for multi-touch. Yeah. So you have a rectangle where you can have multi-touch. So, so just quick handle that automatically if you've got two mouse input areas. If you have two mouse input area, you only have one with the, which, is, which is having the, the mouse event at a time. Right. Okay. So you, you won't have this problem. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I can, uh, for example, uh, I, I know where you're saying, and uh, I, uh, another, another day, one of these days, I was doing something that was kind of evil, which was, you know the Mac doc? Everybody knows the Mac doc. And I wanted to do, componentize the Mac doc. So basically what I tried to do uh, was to, each element was its own component in QML. And so I defined a massive uh, mouse area for that component. And then I declared, okay, you have um, uh, over enable, which tracks the, relation, the, the position of the mouse in relation to, um, to the item itself. So whenever my mouse was closer to the element I've created, it would scale and go back big or small. So I had that problem because the moment I wanted several, several of them and to be overlapping, uh, then it created a problem because the overlapping parts only could be aware of one. So I had to do a really evil trick that was to <laughs> set a timer and start <laughs> to <laughs> flipping them and have a little behavior element animation so it wouldn't go on and off instantly. So it worked, but it was very evil. <laughs> So, see, only one can receive the mouse event yeah. at one time. Okay, thanks. But if you really want to have multi-touch, you have you have an item. It's not in Qt Quick, in Qt by default, but there's a, there's something in the labs. I think in in Qt labs for multi-touch <coughs> and for gesture also. Okay, so, so that's something that should be in Qt. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be in Qt. Uh, I think for Qt5. Maybe Qt4.8, I didn't look. But I think it's in beta, I'm not sure. And finally, um, another type of interaction which is flickable and instead of me trying to explain what flickable is, showing it is much more easy. So, it's this easy. It's something that we are very accustomed to in mobile phones to expect things to move in a flickable way, which is very natural when you're interacting with your fingers and something. Where in mouse, it's normal to have this type of behavior. It doesn't feel weird. But this type of behavior I'm mimicking here, it's uh, moving and stopping automatically. But in real life, you expect things to be flickable. If I move this paper, it doesn't instantly stop. It moves along a little bit more. And just an example. So it's easy. You define the width and the height, the content size as well, and, and then you declare the, the content inside it. Um, in this case, it's image. Uh, and you can do some things. And I advise you always to go and see what the thing does. And it has all of these properties, see? A lot of properties. And horizontal velocity, maximum flick velocity. But for example, let's see what if we want to make it flickable only vertically. And <coughs> flickable direction. I could go here. Or 
and copy this and paste there, or I could go to my favorite tool and select Flickable, and Flickable Direction, I just want to do Vertical Flick. Let's see what happened in the code. It made it like this. Press play, let's see if it works. So, yeah, only vertical. Horizontal doesn't work anymore. See? Pretty easy. As a developer, I was a bit reluctant at, at first to use the QML d designer because it, it's creating some, uh, some QML code you are going to use. And uh, I thought it would be messy and uh, a lot of code for, for almost nothing for displaying a rectangle, for example. But the designer is quite good. And it's a, it's a good start when you have to, to start doing something in QML, start a screen or anything. Yes, and um, can you combine little? Sorry. Uh, can you combine applicable objects with states and transitions so you can implement, uh, for example, like an Android or an iOS to switch between uh, screens? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes, you can, but we won't use a flickable in this case. We, use, um, we will use uh, what we call a list view with one item at a time. And you'll change uh, using uh, the, the, this one. I yeah. think he wants to, you want to, to be aware of the finger, right? Yeah, to maybe to, to have it like a, a gesture with your finger. He wants maybe to follow like the finger as he goes. Oh. Then oh. You, you, yes, you can with Flickable. You, you just, yeah. It just needs to and have the, the, the positioning, the positioners to, it's, it needs to be an element. Oh, wait, yeah. oh, oh no, yeah. I, I'm not sure we, yeah, <laughs> we are just the Don't worry, thing. there's several ways you can do it. That's okay. the, the, the magic about QML. Oh, about code, or, I think. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can always... You can do things in many, many ways. That thing is easy to do, and there's several ways of, of doing it. Flickable, I want to think about it a bit, if I would do it with Flickable. I, I wouldn't use a flickable, but we, we can discuss this because during a break, if you, okay. if you want. So, let's see if we have plenty of time. Questions. By now, you should be able to answer all these questions. So, please have a look at them and see if there's any of these questions that you cannot answer or, did, or we did not answer. Maybe it's better we ask them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one thing Nuno said is that item is the base uh, element for all visible thing on the screen, rectangle, image, etc. And there's inheritance. Uh, behind the scene, you are all developers. So behind the scene, it's really inheritance. So it's really C++ inheritance. Yeah. 